Oh, welcome to the last and final session of the search track at ApacheCon 2021. And for this session, we're going to be discussing about the, the way Apache Solar PMC handles security vulnerabilities. And for this panel discussion, I'm going to quickly introduce myself just so that you know uh, who's also on the screen. Um, I'm a PMC member and committer for the Apache Lucene and Solar Project, and I work at Apple right now uh, building search systems. Um, and with me, I have Cassandra Target. Uh, Cassandra has about 20 years of experience in, in search and knowledge management, and she's been on the Apache Lucene Solar, she's been an Apache Lucene Solar Committer since 2013, and a PMC member since 2016. Um, for her day job, she's the Director of Engineering at LucidWorks, uh, where she manages the solar development team. Um, also with us is Mike Drob. Mike works in Apple Cloud Services uh, as an Apache Solar PMC member and committer. He's a veteran of distributed systems, previously working on Apache Hadoop and Apache HBase. Uh, he's passionate about operational experience, uh, including tooling and security, exactly why we're here. Um, when not working on solar, he enjoys Lego robotics and walking his two dogs. And last but not the least, we have David Smiley again. Uh, David, uh, David has been on many search projects continuously since 2006 with a focus uh, on backend implementation with Apache Lucene and Solar. Um, he's actively involved with a lot of open source projects and is a PMC member and committer on the Lucene and Solar project. So he's certainly involved with, with decision making and, and security aspects of the project on a day to day basis. So welcome uh, all of you once again. And uh, just to get started, uh, Let's talk a little bit about the solar, solar as a project. Uh, what what do you think about the scale at which solar is being used, whenever you use it, however you use it? Just to give everyone an idea of what you think about it. Is this about security? Yeah. Yep. I'll get there. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. I, I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm just asking about the scale at which solar you use solar uh, and the impact it might have in terms of just security. Like, how, how critical is solar to your system? Mike, do you want to take that? Uh, it's it's uh, very critical. I mean, it's like solar powers a lot of a lot of different um, services and products, both. Um, I mean, at my employer, I'm I'm here not representing my employer, but you know, I'm aware of many many systems, both internally and externally. Um, probably like lots, lots and lots and lots of dollars of revenue tied to it. Um, I can't even imagine what that number is. Uh, can't count that high. Okay, um, David, I David guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Something um, to yeah, I would, I would say absolutely the same as, as Mike. Um, search is critical for many. Uh, as, a, as a user nowadays, you often get to what you want via search instead of navigating and browse. So it's just so so critical that it works. And so, um, and, and also like Salesforce, uh, where, where I work, um, customer data is treated with, like security, I'd say, is much more important than any other company I, I've worked at. So I really say just how much care is put into customer data and keeping each customer separate. So it really matters that we can keep, um, that we can separate um, the data we have for each of our customers and making sure that only they, they can search their data and, and nobody else. And not even us. As a search engineer, I cannot go looking at any customer's data. I, I have to go get all kinds of approvals that I don't, I'm not authorized to normally ask for. Okay. Uh, Cassandra, is there something that you'd like to add? Well, I mean, my experience, LucidWorks provides a, a software application that runs on top of solar. So all of our dozen, hundreds of customers run solar. Uh, and so uh, for them, I mean, my interaction with security issues is usually in reaction to, you know, to, to helping support them. And for them, you know, the security of their systems is paramount. I mean, it's one of the the main things that they that they have to do uh, to to integrate it in with their environment. You know, they have uh, 
uh, you know, they usually have dedicated teams which are analyzing the software, make sure that it doesn't have vulnerabilities in it. And they do that for every piece of software that enters their network. Yeah, so uh, it's pretty critical. So great. Uh, sounds like it's solar certainly a critical piece of infrastructure and security is super important, especially because uh, it, you, you're handling data in solar. In terms of the project itself, how often do you think, uh, how often do you think does it happen that you would re receive a report about security vulnerability? Off the top of my head, I want to say every four months or three or sometimes a couple can happen kind of together. Uh, I don't know why that happens, but on average, a handful a year, maybe. Um, yeah, I think they tend to uh, come together, like David said, uh, we find one and then people kind of get inspired by that and start looking and then we find maybe two or three other ones that are kind of similar in nature, um, you know, just a little bit tweak there or a little bit tweak this way. Um, so I, I don't know how often exactly, but it's not uncommon by any means. Okay. and. Who's, who are generally these reporters? Where, where do these generally end up coming from? Is it something that the PMC or the, the contributors find? Uh, where, where's this coming from? I've observed some of them are security researchers. I don't have insights into this field, but I've, from what I've gathered, there are people that make their livelihood off of finding bugs and reporting them. And somehow they're incentivized from their employer, or maybe uh, if they're able to report it against a big company, there are bounties. And sometimes we read blogs about very, very interesting hacks. Um, so I, I think there are some people that are, that are, are uh, it's definitely tied to their livelihood. And in particular, they want a CVE in particular, because that is that is their, their victory right there. And if they don't get a CVE, they're not happy. <laughs> I can say firsthand that they're not happy in, in dealing with those um, security reporters. It's, it's not fun. And the PMC, if I don't give them what they want. So, so Sandra, uh, considering uh, they're, at least from what I heard Mike and uh, David mention, doesn't seem like a lot of these are often they they come from within the PMC itself. They're generally externally reported. Is there a process of how how people are supposed to report these so security researchers or whoever these people might be? Uh, yeah, actually, there is a process, and it's actually dictated by the ASF, the Apache Software Foundation itself. There's Mark Cox this morning gave a talk about this, which I would encourage anyone interested in this to to find once it's once the video is available. Um, just to talk about there's a security team within the ASF who handles these. And so the very first thing that should happen if someone thinks they found a problem is to email security at apache.org. Uh, and uh, the solar community and the scene as well both have security at solar.apache.org and, you know, lucene.apache.org, um, which can be CC'd on those if, you know, it could, it could go directly to security at Apache or to to the security at solar address, um, the security team at the ASF is actually would, would also receive, would receive the messages either way. And the reason why is because they both, um, the, the security team actually, you know, they have a, a process for handling this and they will make sure that they're tracking it, right? So if for whatever reason we miss the email or, you know, don't, don't respond right away, they will actually interact with the PMC of the project to make sure that it's being addressed in a in a timely manner, and um, if it's you know an end can help us navigate the waters of you know it maybe it shouldn't really have a CVE and we need to explain that to the researcher or or, or something like that. Um, and at that point, the 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 report is it goes to the PMC of the project whether it's forwarded by the security team or not, but they. Uh, it, it's kept within the PMC, and it's actually a, one of the rules is that it should not be discussed publicly. Um, it should only be discussed with, between the researcher and the PMC, um, and because if it is a true vulnerability, we do not want it getting out into the wild before we have a chance to mitigate it, right? We do not want, you know, we don't want to leave, everyone obviously could be exposed or certain numbers of people could be exposed, and we don't want that to get out. Um, before we have a chance to tell people exactly how to prevent themselves from, from being vulnerable to it. Um, and 
it, you know, and then within the PMC, we figure out what we're going to do about it and uh, may issue a, uh, may have a, may have a, may have to do a new release. We may be able to provide mitigation steps. We may have a workaround. Uh, that workaround may include like turn off this feature. <laughs> if you're not using it, then you won't be vulnerable. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, often we'll, we'll combine it with a software release. <clears throat> so that's there. So, and then once, it's, once we release the software, then we, you know, we'll announce it. So. Okay. So that sounds, that sounds a pretty streamlined process in terms of what people are expected to do, you know, in order to report something, but let's walk through the process. So someone finds something that they think is a potential vulnerability. It is then sent to security at Apache or security mailing list that the PMC controls for the project. Uh, once the PMC looks at it, are there guidelines that the PMC follows in terms of how or what they would or would not consider a potential CVE? Or is there anything around that? I don't think so. <laughs> um, unless, unless one of you wants to jump in um, as someone who looks at these reports and tries to tries to adjudicate them, I guess you could say. Um, there isn't really. I think it's up to as a project as to define what um, how we handle each report. Um, and then there's a major there is a key decision point is is it CVE worthy or not? If it is, mm -hmm. it goes through a very well defined process that ASF defines for us. Um, that it doesn't involve, of course, as I said, giving a CVE -E and doing a release and um, and how we conduct it internally. There ends up being a, uh, a JIRA issue, by the way, that is flagged as private. Um, I think it, um, I, 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 I forget whether it ends up being, it depends, but sometimes there ends up being a public version and the private version. The public version is vague and the private version is sensitive. Or I think I've seen it go multiple ways. Um, and in the end, there's a release uh, with, with an announcement. And, and uh, we go, it's kind of a lengthy process and it's um, kind of a big deal. I, I'd say that it, it's, it's definitely frustrating as a PMC member trying to, when I get something that's a gray area, like is this really a problem? Um, because historically solar in, in the very, very early days, I think back to when I started contributing in like, oh, you know, I don't know, like oh, so eight or seven, um, like, it was very much on your own at that time, you, the user of solar, to secure whatever needs securing, it was you to, to make that happen. And, and, um, and sure, like I, I remember when I, I uh, before it was an official vulnerability, I remember figuring out that, hey, I could submit a search query that could delete data. <laughs> That's, most people probably wouldn't like, like that. Uh, and it, it, at that time, there wasn't a big security process. I just, hey, I, I just reported a bug. This is bad. And here's an example. Don't click this link. Very bad. Don't click that link on your machine. It'll probably delete your index. And uh, I'm fixing this bug now. Uh, we've come a long way since then. Um, so I, I've, I've tried to get some feedback from our user community in the past about solar security posture. Um, and what what are the basic assumptions we have? And I, I say I struggle with this. I know I'm doing a lot of talking. There's a, there's a lot I could say about this. Um, in, in particular, I want to say that in general, I, I look at the advice we give users in the ref guide, and, and and what Solar logs when it starts up. If so, if you're not using Solar's authentication authorization framework, if if the bug um, basically can't happen if you're using that framework, then uh, I say, well, you should be using that framework. And yes, many people don't use that framework. I know many people who don't for very valid reasons, um, but that that's one kind of major gate in my mind. Uh, and furthermore, many handlers in solar have um, are hooked up into this framework and have a, a level of access, like it's, it's read versus write versus something. And if I see that, that the affected operation is like a write or some higher level, it's not read, then that means that you must have authorized this user to, to get that higher level of permission beyond read and therefore you shouldn't be doing that unless it's for an administrator say. So that's those that's some of the thoughts so, that go through my mind. So so from from what I hear, there's there's a bunch of gray area. Uh, something gets reported uh, that someone thinks um, is worthy of a CV. Um, as you just mentioned, uh, you've really um, you know, you have people who are trying to make their livelihood out of finding bugs and finding security vulnerabilities and open source systems and software that exist across the planet. Um, when such a thing happens, when things lie in the gray area, 
what is the general process? Is is the contributor supposed to be responsible to engage in that process to to kind of talk to you and pitch the idea as to why they strongly think, or is this is this a one way traffic of someone reports something and then the PMC just discusses it amongst itself without reaching out to the to the reporter? Mike, do you want to comment on that? Like, what's the process there? Like, is there engagement by the reporter at all? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Um... It's, uh, there's not an expectation and there, there's not like an obligation, um, that, oh, you reported like, you know, if you're the reporter, you can just drop it off and we're happy to take it from there. Um, most reporters do want to stay engaged because like David was saying, they want that CVE, they want their name on it at the end. Um, it's like a, it's like a trophy for them. Um, Sometimes, yeah, they're they're pitching that like, come on, this is this is a CVE. This is, you know, um, or they want uh, they need the CVE as a cudgel to get teams to upgrade because teams are like, oh, we're running this old version. Um, we only do security upgrades. We don't do feature upgrades. So they need they need that as uh, I guess it would be the stick. It's not a carrot anymore. Yeah. Okay. Cassandra, is there something you would want to add to this? Um, I, I mean, I think at some level, it, the researcher, it, in cases where it's a direct CV, you know, a direct report against solar, I, I think the researcher probably has a vested interest. And in, it's always it's always helpful if someone discovers something, if they can be engaged in in the dialogue right I, of saying here's how i found it here's how i exposed it here's you know here's why i think it you know is a vulnerability as opposed to you know leaving it to the pmc um or you know and i cer certainly the pmc doesn't I'm, in my opinion doesn't want to just have this weight alone right um if someone you know and, and there's also right a, per public, a perception too like if we reject the vulnerability report the person could very well then turn around and you know write something publicly mm -hmm. that may look more damning you know uh, you know on the surface than it actually is but you know the way they frame it you know they could say so, like oh you know there are, you know elasticsearch gets sometimes gets dinged with oh you know every elasticsearch server is vulnerable well every elasticsearch ser server that you put on the open internet without authentication of course right it's not elastic like what are they supposed to do Right. And solar's in the same exact position. Like, what are we supposed to do? If you're going to put it, you know, uh, out there like that, then, you know, of course it's, so, it, you know, uh, of course someone can get at it. I, actually, I have an interesting anecdote. Someone here at LizWorks had a, uh, put up a solar cluster, I think in AWS, uh, just as like a test, like a little test, like little play, local, little play environment for themselves. Within one day, crypto like crypto hackers had found it and started using those servers to uh yeah started using those servers to mine and within one day like and and you know and he was like oh my god i didn't even knew this could happen it's like well you it's on the open internet what do you think's gonna happen like <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, and that's a good segue to secure by default i think and, yes and um yeah i started a conversation in the solar user list about with the title secure by default i think uh some number of months ago this year um, getting some feedback on on ideas, um, and there's sort of a tug of war between easy to get going with solar and what you should or shouldn't do in production versus on your machine. Um, I, I proposed some ideas. It's a bit of a back and forth of ideas. Um, I, I proposed. I mean, it, an, an obvious answer that, that one of these um, security research presented on one of these things that they wanted it to be a CV where they, as they said, well, maybe solar should have a username and password. And yeah, maybe that's sort of an easy answer, but it's also a barrier. Um, so uh, other other ideas as, as well, um, like solar listening on um, local host only, and, and there's ways of upgrading that. And um, whether solar should have a mode like prod versus dev, and therefore lots of uh, bells and whistles are enabled in dev mode, but maybe in prod you have to explicitly enable, you know, this is my proposal, in a prod mode that you would explicitly have to enable configuration editing, um, assuming you want to do that. Because many people run solar without using the admin APIs to edit their configs. Instead, right, they, they right. Post, right. That's a perfect so, example. So um, from what I'm hearing uh, so far, 
uh, other than the one aspect that Sandra just mentioned, just like once, let's say, someone reports something, it comes to the PMC, uh, the PMC decides it's not worthy enough of a CVE. And if, if you were to reject it, they might go, back, go out and start writing about that stuff, exposing a vulnerability that might not be CVE worthy, but is still a vulnerability for anyone who does not know how to use sort of write, right? Uh, have there been incidents uh, that you want to talk about uh, where something like this has happened, where someone's come out, either reported it the wrong way or reported it uh, something that wasn't worthy of a CV, was not serious enough, but went out to, uh, you know, tell other people with not nice interests about a possible loophole in Soror that's not that's running in an unsecured environment. Have, have, have there been incidents when things didn't go as per plan? Yes, mm -hmm. I think in the last year, I remember being harassed by, mm -hmm. I mean, I want to say I've been harassed by the security researcher who kept on arguing for a CVE and I, it just, it just didn't quite cross the line in my mind. And, and that person could point to thousands of solars on the public internet. And I said, well, those are, those are thousands of users that shouldn't be doing that. Um, and then of course, and you know, I even randomly chose like six of them or something. And I tried, I, I, I tried to do assess whether or not they had enabled that authentication framework and they didn't, of course they didn't. Very few people do, by the way. Um, and but, so, well, yeah. But, <laughs> but Cassandra, a uh, question to you, I guess, uh, have you been in a position where you had to like, where, where someone did not even follow the, the process of reporting it through the regular? So um, some people, I would debate, uh, may not know what the, ex what the right way to approach the PMC for problems like these is and might send something to say the user mailing list. How does the PMC handle a situation yeah. like that? And has that happened? Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely happened. It definitely happened a couple of years ago, I think while I was PMC chair <laughs> and uh, well, I think I was on vacation actually at the time. So it was yes. really a good time <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, where I actually and I think there was a Z. I actually just Googled it. There was a ZDNet article about it, um, which, um, it, you know, basically called it a zero day and the, the researcher exposed it before coming to the PMC um, and, you know, I, and, and it's absolutely like the wrong way to, to handle it because all of a sudden, like we, as a, as a community, one thing, you know, one thing about open source communities is it's very difficult. There was also like a keynote talk this morning when someone said, when someone was talking about like open source communities, but I mean, they're self-motivated, they're self-organizing. What that means is there's no like head of person to, you know, whip the troops into like getting things done. You know, we all have responsibilities during the day. And so exposing a zero day like vulnerability in an open source project is one of the worst things you can do because it is really hard to, to fix, to solve. Like to, you know, we're not, you know, Microsoft or Apple or, you know, where we've got teams of people like red, you know, at the ready to like come out with patches. <laughs> how, how, how did, how, how did so, the solar community handle something like that? Like uh, something got written in the media before the PMC knew about it and the PMC learned about it from the article that was published uh, available for people to read I mean, and exploit. This is the XMLQ parser one. Is, is uh, actually, it was the config API one. Never mind. Actually. Yeah. Um, so the, there was uh, more than one. Yeah, maybe. Oh, I yeah. Think yeah, yeah, there was XML more. One. One was there were two that were like announced together, but yes. Yeah, but we already had when this was announced, we actually had a fix for that, and that they sort of said, "Here's a fix for this one. Oh, and here's a zero day," and it was sort of like, "Well, wait." <laughs> <laughs> like we don't know. Um, so I, you know, we had to. I mean, so we did have to. People had to sort of self-motivate and take it seriously. And I mean, there was a lot of strife around it, if I recall correctly. Um, and it was, uh, you know, through as I said, I was on vacation. It just threw everything into, you know, disarray. Um, and we did. I mean, I think we came out with the patch pretty quickly. Um, you know, considering, but it was it it, it was really hard time. Um, and obviously we. It did expose some some flaws in the process in the community. Um, we actually tightened up quite a bit with we, that's when we made the security mailing list. Um, <clears throat> that's when you know we actually we started actually getting uh, I think there's a notification that comes to the PMC like every week about mm -hmm. any possible Jira issues that are private that have been filed you know that maybe need attention. Um, so uh, it, you know we actually tightened up some of the processes so 
at least we'd get, if notifications had come through, at least we would have gotten them. We would get them. Um, and, you know, wrote a specific security page on the website, you know, to, to, to kind of, you know, and, and really tightened up the ref guide language about how you should be. And, and came up with some things that we fixed in Seoul, too. Um, you know, about, you know, trying to actually take more of a secure by default posture. posture. Um, okay. Which very much was the message before that was very much like what David said earlier. You know, uh, it's up to it's you on to you. figure it out. Yeah. And it's up to you to do it. Right. Yeah. So, uh, Mike, you've been involved with a bunch of uh, CVE reports and fixes in the recent past, right? Um, I'd like to know what's the process like in terms of uh, but the scene in Sora used to be this one thing, the repository split. So now, you know, there's the, the repository is in multiple places. If you really look at where the 9x release is going to come from, so you have the, the main branch is somewhere else and the 8x is somewhere else and it looks different. So there's complexities around backporting. Is there is there a guideline that the community follows, like you follow for your recent fixes after the projects have split, uh, split up? Like how, what's what's the guidance like? Uh, yeah, so we we try to backport. Obviously, like if if the fix is just on unreleased code, then it's not doing anybody any good. And part of part of the security process that's defined by the the foundation for us is you know you have to release the fix um, before you can announce it. So usually um, we'll backport it into a, uh, a bug fix release or a double dot or whatever you want to call it. So like um, 882 was a, uh, had two, three, had three CVEs in it. Um, and then uh, even normally we don't go back another version, but um, even after we were well into the eight line, we still did a seven, seven, two and a seven seven three for um i don't even remember what that one was but i do remember that it was, it was like particularly egregious um security vulnerability and we're like yeah we should we should dust off the old the old line and kind of help the people out that are on the old versions um interesting so uh well, it seems like the community tries to do as much good as possible, uh, of course, within whatever bandwidth is available to the people who are working on the project. Um, what's the process like once the once you have the fix uh, and you've released it? How does the rest of the world, the users, basically get to know about some there is a problem with existing systems and they should upgrade? Like, how how's that communicated? Uh, is this is this for me again? Open I, question. Anyone who wants to take take that, you could answer that considering you just did some releases. So. Sure, yeah, yeah. So for the releases that I did, um, we had to announce it in a lot of places. Like we're trying to let as many people know as possible. Um, so it's part of our release notes. It's on our web page. Um, we have a separate security feed on our web page that's along with all the releases. Um, it's when there's a CVE number, it's that gets blasted out to all of the CVE channels. So that shows up on the MITRE website, who's the organization behind all the CVEs. Um, I think there's a couple other sites that mirror that information, um, maybe NIST or uh, other security organizations. Um, we have to send it out to announce at apache.org. All the CVEs for all the projects go there. Um, it goes to a couple, um, Linux security lists too, just because we want to let that community be informed too. Um, like the open well security, um, there's a security researchers list. I forget exactly which one, um, but, it, but we try and put it like as many places as possible. Hopefully you see it somewhere. Great. So uh, for, for me as a, as a user of, of the solar project, if I had to sign up, uh, to a place without being overwhelmed with all the emails coming in, what would be the right place for me to track anything like this so that I, I'm up to date, uh, but also not overwhelmed? Because if I'm receiving, you know, 50, 40 emails a day, signed up to a mailing list, that's been mostly other stuff, 
uh, I'd probably miss this info important communication. What's the best way for me to know about, I'm less bothered about feature releases, I'm really conscious about say security, or what's the best way for me to stay safe that way and know, be informed? I would probably say if you you should subscribe to the feed that's on the security page on the website, because then that, that that's just, you know, just news items related to CVEs. Is, that's all is that is that like an RSS? Yeah, and it's pretty low that... Yeah, okay. it has an RSS feed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not a it's not a mailing list. Uh, it is an mm -hmm. okay, great. Um, that is that is really good to know. Um, do you want to talk? I was going to add, add something in general. I mean, many. I mean, most projects to have lots of dependencies, not just solar, but other things. And this is becoming more and more common for there to be scanners to say, hey, your dependency is out of date. Um, and in particular, point out a, a, a so-called patch release or the third digit jump. So if you're on a certain version of solar that that is getting a maintenance release, it's po probable that it could be a, a, a there, there could be a security vulnerability being fixed in there. So in general, just paying attention to those things. And because it's not just solar here, this is, mm. um, there are many things that projects depend on. That, that's a really good point. Cause if we upgrade a dependency because there's a CVE and the, an older version, we're not going to necessarily announce that. We're just going to say that the version was bumped. Um, and uh, it's actually a nice segue into vulnerability scanners in general. If we want to go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mentioned That's, to these guys I, earlier. I, I had a lot of thoughts. I, I, I have a, I, I have, I, I want to take this conversation into a different path. Considering, um, you know, all of you work at, at companies where, um, you know, there's there's only a handful of sort of PMC members across the world uh, who are kind of privy to this information before it's public information. Um, and from what one of you mentioned earlier in this discussion, the reason why you want to keep this information is to make sure that it does not get into the hands of people who should not have this right before the a release is out. Um, being at the companies that you work at, uh, knowing that you're engaged with people who are using solar at scale, how do you how do you work with those people wearing different hats, David, as you mentioned, uh, not letting others know? that you know about something specific, but still trying to keep your system safe? Like, how do you, how do you work? How do you walk that fine line? Uh, I'd want to get an answer from each one of you on that. Do you mind asking? Well, maybe if they answer first. I was hoping you could clarify the question a little bit. Like, how do I walk sure. a fine line? Of so so uh, you work at companies well, where you can't talk about a vulnerability, but you know about it because you're on the PMC. Now, yeah. how do you, how do you tell how do you not tell the rest of your team that they should not be doing this right now without telling them there's a known CV here, we're working on it, it's yet to be released, but I can't tell you about it. So Mike, do you want to take that? Maybe that's going to help David as well understand that. Um, yeah, so it, it to be blunt a little bit, like you just, you don't tell them, right? It's they'll find out in general, um, people, users, they're going to find out with the rest of the world. Um, like they don't get special privileges. Um, I, I want to say that there's, there's a little bit of an exception for like, I'm working with smart people. Everybody's working with smart people. Um, and like, if I don't understand something about crypto or like something about like, how do these pieces fit together? Um, you know, I have these resources available to me. Um, I'm not going to try to figure out like, oh, okay, is this encryption correct? Am I doing this right? Like, and just kind of stumble around in the dark. So I will ask other folks about like, hey, what's what's the right way to do this? What's the right way to solve this? Um, but I'm not going to be telling them like, oh, this is for this is for a solar zero day exploit that if you knew about this, you know like all the public servers would be hosed. If you knew, okay. you'd freak out. <laughs> yeah, if you knew, you'd freak out. Like, it's, it's like how, you know, you, you can okay. get help without 
telling people so, exactly what the problem yeah. is. David, and, and I'd say Sandra? I'm the same. I just don't. I just don't tell. I just don't tell them. I mean, I you know, I mean, I I wait until it's out, and then I will say, you know, I mean, so for for LucidWorks, I mean, we have this product Fusion. When we have a solar upgrade, we have to have a new release of Fusion. So you know, I I just kind of wait till it's out, and then say, okay, now you need to do, yeah, now now the Fusion team needs to figure out like what you're going to do about this, um, because it's sort of a a dependency, there. So. Okay. David, what's your take? So my my understanding is not that. Um, so I may be, you know, I may be wrong, but my understanding is that is that this knowledge is not treated like with with absolute secrecy. Is that it needs to be um, only shared with with care with relaying the knowledge that it's not public to a colleague that can help you fix it. For example, like at the time, I remember seeing a vulnerability reported by probably security researcher and thinking, hey, I bet my wouldn't it be nice if my team could fix this problem. And I go to my colleague Bruno and I and at the time Bruno was, I don't even know if he was a committer yet, whatever, but he wasn't on the PMC. So he didn't know about this. And I said, well, hey, you know, I, I can tell you about this vulnerability so you can help fix it. Um, that seemed perfectly reasonable to me. I wasn't trying to blab amongst the world. It was just it was I shared with with, with intentionally and and saying that this is private. So that was relatively so you, straightforward. So, so from what I understand, it seems like a consensus, or at least in the minds of the three of you, at least, where you're willing to talk about it to the people you know are not going to cause harm and going to bring value uh, in the effort to fix the known vulnerability, right? Or to figure out whether that's a vulnerability. If there's any value that can be provided by someone, you're happy to get their help and to share some information with them. Uh, so there's not a hard line of like I cannot talk, tell anyone about anything like this, but I'm gonna be I'm gonna make a judgment call. Great. Um, yeah, I want to. Can I add one thing to that, Antrim? Yeah, yeah. Um, part of the part of the issue is you know obviously we want to have all this transparency. We're doing open source. We're doing this community development, but also for security issues, um, if you share the issue. Sometimes there's just not a remediation that people can do. Like if the answer is you need to upgrade, but there's not a release for them to upgrade to, then like what's what's the point of taking my time and taking their time to worry about this thing that there's no there's no actionable um, mitigation or remediation for for the security issue. Um, so that's that's part of it too. Like, why yeah. not just mm -hmm. share everywhere? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, I, I have made the mistake. I I have made the mistake in the past of letting uh, sort of people know a little bit that something was coming, and and then suddenly they wanted to be part of this part of the solution in ways that they weren't just not able. Right. It needs to be someone who can actually impact the solution. You know, at, whether by helping helping figure it out. You know, I mean, I, I remember one time I ended up in like two days of meetings about like how we're going to tell customers about a thing that had didn't even have a solution yet. You know, and I was like, I'm mm -hmm. never doing this again. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, we were also getting questions. Uh, one of them is Uwe asked, uh, how do you handle security reports that go directly to say Salesforce or LucidWorks or at Apple to up security? Uh, like from either one of your customers or internal teams, are they forwarded to the ASF or do you try to solve them yourselves? Um, I can try and I'm not sure if I'm answering it exactly, but in general, my team discovers vulnerabilities through typical scanners and, and stuff. And in general, of all, all of our software, I'm, I don't know if that question was specifically about a, uh, a bounty hunter basically telling the company about something. Would, and I heard that there's programs like this, but my company's so big that I don't know yeah. much more. So, so David, I think I think the question's more around not who's reporting it, but the question's around if your teams figure out, internal teams figure out that there's a known vulnerability or they find, they find something, do you try to solve it yourself or do you also follow the standard practice or standard you know, guidance around how to report a vulnerability in the Apache Solar project, like, do you follow the same thing? If even if you f find something internally, considering you're on the PMC, do you do you follow the same thing? Of course. Um, I, I don't think it's happened yet, or I don't know. Maybe I'm forgetful right now. I don't think it's happened yet, but I would certainly. The process is for everyone, everybody. So, okay. Mike, 
Do you want to add something, Cassandra? Yeah, this this did happen to us um, where I was working with uh, with somebody internally, and we were just kind of poking around, and uh, there was kind of a "Hey, that's that's weird" moment, and then somebody else said like, "Yeah, that you shouldn't be able to do that. How did you?" How did you do that? And then so we we started digging into that and we spent maybe a few days internally looking at it, trying to understand. And at that time, we didn't know that it was a, you know, actually a security vulnerability. We thought it was probably just a misconfiguration on our end. Uh, but then as soon as we figured out what it was and how it was, um, kind of we just went through the same process because there's uh, it's that it's the open source model that there's smart people who don't work for you, right? So leverage their expertise um, for getting help and we need to get the fix into a release. And then that was one of the ones in uh, in 8.8.2. Sarah, you have anything to add? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's happened to us once or twice. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely follow the process. I mean, it's, it, you know, it, it, I think we worked on it. <laughs> But like we fix it, but we didn't. But it, only through the the process. I mean, same as if they found okay. out any other bug, actually. Okay. Any other problem goes through the community following that process. Okay. Um. Well, we have another question which says, uh, from Artem, how much time do users have to upgrade before you announce the CV? I think the answer. The answer to that is. Well, it's announced together. Right. Yeah, I mean, we announced it at the same time. The, yeah, this release they, fixes this CVE. Yes. So, yeah. so they, they nobody they knows that they, they, they nobody knows None. they need to upgrade <laughs> right. it right before the announcement happens. Uh, outside of the PMC. I mean, it would be hard to it it'd be hard to announce the C, announce the release to fix the CVE that we haven't announced yet. You know what I mean? Like we yes. have to we have to announce them together. Like it, right. It, it's you know. I think the question is the question. Um, like, could we release and then a week later say, by the way, this release fixed such and such CVE, I um, which I, I think is an interesting, um, it's an interesting idea, but the downside of that is is obviously that people didn't know about the CVE for another week or something, so. Yeah, I, I, I also feel the same way. I feel like if the people don't know about a, a release fixing a critical security issue, they're probably not not upgrade to it right when it's released. Like a very few people upgrade the week it, or the day it gets released, unless it's a known problem. Um, okay, and uh, Andy asked a question. Is there a policy for addressing CVEs raised against dependencies? Yeah, I'm on the first Cassandra, I'm guessing, based on her handling of the wiki. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so dependencies are interesting. I, often the dependency, we, we know about dependencies through uh, like scanning tools. Um, and so this, I'm going to kind of answer a big, like go a little bit beyond the question a little bit. Um, I, there are, you know, a lot of organizations have policies that any software coming into the network has to be scanned, like by something like Black Duck or something else. Um, and we have had people actually send us, you know, a Black Duck report and say, you know what, Solar's insecure, fix all these things. And um, I, I actually at LucidWorks have somebody, there's a customer who somehow somebody signed a contract that they get to send that to me every quarter. Um, and <laughs> so it, uh, um, so I, I'm quite well versed in it. And uh, so, you know, a, a difficult thing is that not all vulnerability, you know, those reports end up with a lot of false positives. And so it becomes a really difficult exercise to sort through and figure out like which one right, which ones can, which ones even apply to the software and um, it, you know, which ones don't. And even like, could it even be exposed, right? So one common one is uh, vulnerability scanners will sometimes like just, they just know the name of the, the you know, the name of the jar or whatever. And uh, you know, and the version and they report it. Now, maybe, you know, when you look at the actual CVE, it might say, well, in the C++ version of this code, like it, there's a vulnerability. Well, it gets reported by every single vulnerability scanner 
but we're not using the C++ version. Like we're using the mm -hmm. Java version. <laughs> and um, those tools are incentivized to report as many vulnerabilities as possible, right? So if it only found 10, it would be, you know, it'd say, well, I've only found 10, but this other one finds a thousand. So this other one must be better. So th their, <laughs> their interest is to report as many as possible. And there's no facility for communities such as ours to say, hey, you keep reporting, you know, like carrot two guava, like against us, but this is only used in inter like this is only used in this one thing and we don't consider it a valid vulnerability. So like stop telling your people to report it to us. Um, and so, so that's actually quite, quite difficult. We actually have a wiki page that tracks uh, a couple dozen maybe uh, uh, jars that frequently get reported and sort of with an explanation of why we don't consider it valid. Um, and, you know, but every one of those dependencies actually, I mean, we do, if we do find, you know, so internally at Lucidworks, we have a process where our support folks are actually asked to go through the list, the vulnerability scanning report that they get, compare it to this wiki page, and then only send me like the diff. <laughs> so, so I have a little bit less to work, a little bit less in every single one we have to look at actually and, and try to figure out like, what's the vulnerability? What is it actually in a code path that's used by solar? Uh, because we may not call the class that's, we may right. not ever call the class that's vulnerable. And, you know, right. it may not be something. Um, I love that, love and that if it story. is valid, then, you know, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that. I'm looking for a good chance to jump in. I, I love that little story there about all that is code scanners. Yeah. Um, and it goes to show in the bigger picture, don't just give out a CVE for, you know, kind of frivolous reasons, because it's yet another CVE. Ah. And, and some of them are like like an eye roll. If you were to read it, it's like, oh, give me a break. You know, who's going to like a temp directory from JUnit? I'm like, gosh, I mean, what? <laughs> oh, does that really, like, when would that matter? Right. Like, <laughs> you know, and so they matter because as on the receiving end of my company, we get these scanning, we got to do, we got to, it's, like, it's a big numbers game mm -hmm. to, be, to the higher ups. And it's like, you know, where are we? And so, mm -hmm. are, you know, basically we upgrade and, and we try and upgrade. And if we can't, then we look closer at the CVE and then we say, hey, you know, this one doesn't really matter. And then we have to argue that it doesn't matter and get a justification that it doesn't matter. Um, some of these CVEs never should have existed in the first place, maybe. Um, and there's not enough metadata behind them to say that this CVE, wow, okay, okay. No. this was a big one. I remember the mm -hmm. biggest one that ever mm -hmm. mattered to Solar, which is someone could send in the query. They could like switch the switch the parser and then activate some. That that was the that, that CVE. The alarm bells needed to go off. Many of the other ones, uh, you know. Well, Uwe, Uwe did something I would call that bad. But <laughs> Uwe, Uwe sent a link to the chat for his website. Um, do not click on the link because if you do click on that link and are running an old version of Solar on your host, it's going to nuke your data. So uh, a link on Uwe's website is going to nuke data on a Solar instance running on your machine. So just don't do that. There's an image that gets loaded that you will never know about, uh, but your data would be gone. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but we're almost. We're, we're, we've been out of time, but uh, let, I want to wrap this up. Uh, and before I wrap, I want to know from each one of you, uh, is this, what, what, do you, what would you like to communicate with, with a community uh, in terms of just security aspects and either how they report it, how they look at it, how they engage with us? Um, David, do you want to go first? I, th I think... Um... In general, I think we as a project do fine in telling users what they need to do if there's a vulnerability that says it's, it's well, it's on the website clearly marked and I think most people follow the, the process. So I think that's working. I, I would say though that the bigger issue that I find is that as, as a, you know, a project owner thinking of the project, the project's health, um, I think our security kind of posture and advice is a bit awkward. We have solar of the past, which was entirely on you, the user to secure everything. And then the solar of the present is a bit of a mixed message because, hey, we've got an authorization framework and an authentication framework. We've got all these frameworks. And, and um, you know, does that mean that you can finally put solar on the public internet? No, you should still not do that. Um, so so what, what, what is, you know, so what should you do? So I think it's, um, um, I don't know, I, I, I think there's, um, there's, there's something is, is needed to, to put solar in a more clear to, to more for, for the solar project itself to devise a security model that 
is, is um, realistic um, and, and communicate that to the users. Because right now it's honestly a bit of a mixed message. I'm very sympathetic to, to users and on the project side to the project as itself as well. Okay, great. Uh, mm. Mike, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just say we we take the all the security reports very seriously. Um, we we investigate them. We try to solve them as best as we can. Um, we are. I'll echo what David said. Like you know, we are very judicious about what we accept because we know that it creates more work for other people and for enterprises and for companies that depend on this. Um, and sometimes it's just more noise. Um, so not, not everything is a security issue, but the things that are security issues are very important to us. Um, okay, uh, Cassandra. Um, I, I think I would ask people to um, think about like, if the security of your solar index is important to you to take the time to learn about the options while the, you know, while the community is sort of figuring out what our posture is finally going to be, um, <clears throat> find, figure out about the options and, and engage with them. Right. Um, the, uh, if, if you don't have authentication or authorization enabled, it, it's, you know, you can't be shocked if someone accesses something they're not supposed to. Um, and that's true of any system. Um, and I might actually also ask the user community to like, tell us what they would like solar to do, right? Like we are one difficulty with us figuring out like our message of should it be open by default or secure by default or closed by default is that we're not sure like what the user community would like, you know, do they want it to be all locked by default? Do they want to go through? I mean, that you know, it is a barrier to get things going. Is that what they would that's, like? That's it's kind of yeah. us to know, right? Sometimes I think. I, yeah, I guess that's the fine line of, are it, do you want it an easy thing out of the box versus it's secure, but then you have to set all of these things up before you're able to do anything on this. So uh, chicken and egg-ish right. kind of problem. Okay, good. No, mm -hmm. well, great. Uh, we're certainly out of time, but this was great. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure people who who've watched this right now and people who watch this uh, recorded version of this later are going to get a ton of value from this both in terms of the process they should be following also the perspective that the pmc has in terms of all the security reports that come in and how do we handle them so uh thank you again to uh, the three of you and to everyone who's been watching um we'll see you around at the conference thanks everybody bye thanks